Support for Clever comes from BDE. Offering full-service public relations, social media, strategic development, and more. For 20 years, BDE has worked as an extension of companies large and small where design is in their DNA. BDE can elevate the brand and the bottom line by telling your story with passion. What can BDE do for you? Visit bdeonline.biz to find out more. Hi, you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you well. It's Amy and Jamie. Hi, Harry. How are you guys today? Good. How about you? Yeah, all good. I'm having a very productive day, which is nice. Oh, Oh, I love those. Mm -hmm. Hey, guys, I'm Jamie. And I'm Amy. And this is Clever. Today, we're talking to industrial and interior designer Harry Allen. Harry is the guy behind the reality series for Area Wear, which includes the bank in the form of a pig, which is probably the most realistic looking piggy bank ever. He's also designed everything from furniture to lighting to perfume bottles to first aid kit. He's an award-winning designer whose works are in the permanent collections of many museums, including MoMA. In addition to his design cred, we discovered he can tear it up on a pair of roller skates. Yeah. So let's tear it up with Harry Allen. Let's do it. My name is Harry Allen, and I'm an industrial designer, and I live and work in New York City. I am an industrial designer. I work across a lot of different disciplines, and I love what I do. I think I'm pretty good at it. (laughs) We do, too. (laughs) So you're from New Jersey. I am. Originally, I'm from New Jersey. I grew up there. I didn't have much of a commute to get here to New York City. Oh, where in Jersey are you from? Because I'm from Jersey, too. I'm from Wachung, which is, you know, like 45 minutes outside the city by Plainfield and Somerville and Summit in that area. Oh, you're a North Jersey person. North Jersey. So it was I was always sort of in and around New York City growing up. We would come in and go to the theater and come in to eat and spent birthdays here and stuff. So I always sort of knew that I would end up in New York. But it's that suburban view of New York City is really great. Like you can sort of take it as you want, but you're growing up, you know, surrounded by trees and in community, you know, like a suburban community. So I, I, I loved growing up where I did. Yeah. I grew up in Southern New Jersey in Cherry Hill. The Philly experience. Yeah. So right outside of Philly. So we would go into Philly and, you know, I would look at the skyline. I could see it from one of my apartments growing up and be like, oh, that's beautiful. Maybe I'll end up there one day. Well, I grew up outside of Detroit, so I had the Detroit experience, (laughs) which isn't quite as relevant to this discussion, but I just had to jump in there with my city. Well, not (laughs) then, but now, right? I mean, now it's hopping in Detroit, right? Oh, yeah. It's a it's a hotbed of creative action there. And it's lawless. Like you don't need permission to do anything. So a lot of wild and experimental stuff is going down. It's pretty cool. I love that. And New York has become so gentrified and expensive. And, you know, I really, every day I feel so old lamenting the New York that was, you know, I live in the East village, which used to just be, you know, lawless. (laughs) And now it's, you know, it's just so cleaned up and I crave that sort of you know, creative community, but I'm so, I have such deep roots here. I own the place where I live and work and it's, you know, it just, it gets really hard to uproot your life. Growing up outside of New York, going back to that whole New Jersey experience, like I remember driving into the city as a kid, you know, and coming through the Holland Tunnel and getting like butterflies in my stomach because it was so exciting coming into New York City, you know, like what was that adventure going to be? And, uh, I don't get those anymore. But. Oh, I had the same thing <laughs> when I left my suburban Detroit city after high school. You know, I packed all my stuff in a station wagon with my parents and they dropped me off at FIT. And I remember pulling into the city, realizing that I was coming in with my parents and they were just going to leave me there in New York City. (laughs) Yeah, it was so exciting and terrifying at the same time. And I'm so glad I made a decision that I couldn't, you know, revoke because (laughs) they did leave me there. And the first two days were terrifying. But then my whole world opened up and it's a magical city. New York is. 
I think it's like less magical than it used to be. Like you get out into Brooklyn and there's all these little like nooks and crannies and life, you know, that has that exciting edge. But like in Manhattan, you know, it's like so, oh my God, it's just changed so much. Anyway, I sound like such an old man. I'm over <laughs> myself. <laughs> well, let's go back to boyhood. Were you in, you know, in a happy nuclear family or what was your dynamic like growing up? Yeah, I grew up in a, in a four person family, a lot of love. My father was an engineer. My mom was an arts educator. I grew up on this little road called Woodledge Road, pretty beautiful area and pretty idyllic. I grew up in the woods on this little road and there were two other main families with kids and we were all this gang and running through the woods. I mean, we had just tons and tons of freedom and it was pretty idyllic. And my mom and my dad were really fair, smart, creative people. And uh, yeah, it was pretty great. That sounds awesome. Okay, let's talk about the rebellious years. Teenage Harry Allen, were you a perfect angel? A handsome devil? I had the benefit of having an older brother that did, you know, enough bad things that I learned how to not get in trouble for them. So I probably did all exactly the same things, except I had the benefit of the knowledge from him. And so I wasn't that rebellious. Or you just didn't get caught. I didn't get caught. Like, I didn't need to be rebellious because I didn't get caught. Exactly. Right. Okay. so you weren't seeking attention in that way. I had some, you know, personal, you know, I'm gay and I came out when I was 18. So that presented, you know, certain issues. But like I said, I grew up in a very loving family and supporting family and all that stuff worked itself out. I had a lot of great friends. Did you really, you know, struggle with the decision to come out when you were 18? I know like back then it wasn't as easy as it might be now. It was easy to come out to my friends, you know, and Mm -hmm. then... It was harder to come out to my family and they actually found out. I probably wouldn't have told them, but uh, I won't go into the big, long drama that was my coming out story. But it was sort of forced upon me. And ultimately, that was a great thing. And, you know, it could have been a disaster given different circumstances. I mean, I also attribute the location of being right near New York City, you know, like We would come into the theater, you know, we would go eat in the West Village, you know, which was a gay mecca at that point. And my parents were aware of it. I mean, you know, until I met my current partner, my mother still thought I was going to live a miserable, lonely life. So there, you know, that was, (laughs) (laughs) I think that's always the case, you know, like it's, there's great fear on everyone's part. Sure. But in general, I came from a very supportive family and I had a very easy time given that generation, you know, because that was 82, like that, 83, something. And that's the AIDS epidemic as well. So it's there's a level of fear. There wasn't huge awareness of it right then when I came out. But soon thereafter, it Mm. was it became such a huge epidemic. Then I was off at college. I was a little bit sheltered from that. um, And but it was horrible. I mean, then I ended up in New York City in the in the middle of it, which was really pretty devastating. When did you first recognize your talent for design and art? You know, I was always a creative kid. And like I said, my father was an engineer and my mother was an arts educator. So I was given a lot of crayons and I, my, you know, everyone in my family could draw and I was always very good with my hands you know, my pastimes as a child, I was making mud pies and I was building forts. Oh, I bet your forts were so rad. <laughs> forts were rad, mud pies were rocking. You know, that was a hugely <laughs> creative thing. And a lot of arts, a lot of ceramics, a lot of painting. And, you know, there was, there was arts education in the school. And so all through my childhood, I was... You know, I was very creative. And then I went off to private school and it was a very academic situation. They happened to have a ceramic studio where I spent most of my time. I was not hugely academic, but it was a really good school. And I learned a lot by osmosis. And at that point in my life, I couldn't tell you that I I I dreamed of being a potter, but I I could not have made that commitment. And there was no one in the school that like looked at me, I was just this anomaly. Like if you weren't going to be a banker or a lawyer or, you know, a doctor and earn a lot of money, no one knew what to do with you at Mm -hmm. my prep school. So my advisor, like she was like, I don't know what to do with you. So my mother sort of did. So my mother 
put together this list of colleges and one of them was Alfred University and it has a huge ceramics program. And since I had been doing all of this ceramics, she thought, well, if he fails out of the academics, then we'll just roll him over into the art school. Not that it's that easy, but that, that was sort of the thought. And then I got there and uh, like I said, I had learned a lot by osmosis. I, you know, I ended up doing really, really well in, I studied political science at Alfred and, you know, I ended, I was my commencement speaker and I, you know, I had a very high grade point average and stuff. So I did, like, I just did that. Like Once I resigned myself to it and I was pretty happy doing that. And all of my friends were in the art school. But then when I got to New York City, after I graduated and I came back, I realized that I was never going to be the, I mean, what am I going to do with a political science degree? It just made no sense in my life. And mm-hmm. then I slowly worked my way back. I went to Parsons for a semester. I ended up at Pratt. I got my grad degree from Pratt. And then that's how I got into design. That was a long answer. <laughs> but that's the way it happened. <laughs> when you were at Alfred University, it sounds like you were a star pupil. Did you do any partying, drinking, like typical college experience? Are you kidding? <laughs> Well, the great thing about Alfred was I had one leg up because my high school was really, it was like going to college. Like it was a very serious academic environment. So, and Alfred, to be perfectly honest, at that point, you know, was like the academics, it was pretty easy for me and it left me a lot of time to party. So, and then there was also this art school there. So it was very easy for me to plug in to fun and I had great friends up there and you know, it's this, we, they were just, whatever. Yes, I partied. <laughs> <laughs> I could go on and on and on with stories, but no, I wasn't, I was no angel. I've never been an angel. So you got a, a master's in industrial design from Pratt. What was it like during that time? I mean, I know you said you were partying, but what was your main interest in, in designing when you were there? Yeah. And did it really click for you? Is that when you knew this was going to be your calling? Yeah, yeah, totally. Like when I was in high school, I didn't, I never even heard of industrial design. It wasn't even on my radar, you know, just was so far removed from me. But at this point I had sort of done my research. I knew where my strengths lied. And then going to Pratt, you know, like I was, I was also older, you know, like I'd worked a couple of years in New York at this international nonprofit up on the West side. And, you know, I just, I had been around the block just enough to know where I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. And actually all through my grad program, I started working doing just at a very menial level at Prescriptives Cosmetics during that period. So I was working a lot and I was at Pratt, you know, doing the industrial design program. Like you only have two years or whatever to do the grad program, but I knew what I wanted to get out of it. That's the beauty of education later in life is that you're not like, oh, what am I going to do? It's like, I know what I want to do. I know what I need to do in order to get there. And you can sort of just cut through all the, you know, yeah. and, and that's sort of what I did. And even, you know, and then, so then I was like at Pratt, like I said, I was working, I continued working at prescriptives until after I graduated. Actually, I didn't graduate for a couple of years because you had to write your thesis and I got all that got all bogged down because I was working and doing things. But I met a guy at prescriptives, you know, like one of my colleagues there who had done the furniture fair, you know, and so I saw that and I was like, oh, that's cool. I want to do that. You know, like I wanted to start my own company. Probably if you asked me then, I didn't, I probably wouldn't have answered with that same clarity, but I did. That's where I was going. Like I was going to start my own business. And so I, you know, I worked for those couple of years. And then as soon as I could, I just like broke out on my own. Were you working freelance or were you full time? I was full time at Prescriptives and then I quit there. And then I worked freelance for Laura Handler. She was very prominent industrial designer. I worked in her studio for a little bit. And then I just stopped and work and took the spring and designed this line of furniture and then showed it at the furniture fair. And that was really the way that I sort of established my, you know, aesthetic. Mm. What I basically did was I took my thesis, which I was working on. I was designing this line of furniture. I actually, that's an amazing story, but I don't know if you want me to digress yet again. Yes. Yes. 
<laughs> okay. So my thesis, I wanted, I wanted to do furniture because I, that was sort of where I had seen what Scott, this guy that I worked with, he had been in the furniture industry. I was like, that's cool. I like that. And I thought it'd be interesting to do some furniture with another creative type person or, you know, do a collaboration with another creative. And I thought, oh, cooking would be interesting. It'd be interesting to do something with a chef. And so I just started very logically. There was this guy I listened to on the radio. Do you remember the Frugal Gourmet? He was out mm-hmm. of San Francisco. And somehow I called him and I got in touch with him and I, I spoke with him on the phone and I said, you know, are you interested in doing some sort of collaboration? No, we're too far away. That's too difficult. He said, but I'm going to put you in touch with a good friend of mine who's in New York. So he gave me Jacques Pepin's home number. What? <laughs> so I call, who lives out on Long Island. So I call Jacques Pepin and like his wife gets on the phone, Jacques, there's some student on the phone, you know, (laughs) whatever, you know, but it was pre like celebrity chef, you know, like now you could net, you know, you'd have to go through eight people to get to them. But it was, you know, like literally he came to the phone. He said, oh, hi, he was really sweet on the phone. And I told him what I was doing and they all thought it was interesting too. Like it was an interesting idea. And he said, you know what? I can't do it. I'm too busy. He said, but there's this young chef who's just arrived from New York and he's opened a restaurant and I know he'd be interested in doing something fun. And so he gave me the number for Daniel Baloud <laughs> who had just arrived in New York. And actually that's who I did my thesis with. I would go there like at four o'clock there all, all the chefs are free at like between four and six before dinner service after lunch. I would go, I would sit with him. We would talk about what he you know, wanted, whatever. Actually, it ended up being, we we have very different aesthetics. You know, I was doing something very contemporary. I don't know if you've ever been to Danielle, but it's very sort of frou-frou. It's not a, you know, we we, we don't really see eye to eye. But but Mm -hmm. the process, I ended up designing this table. I had envisioned this meal. We talked about it ad nauseum, where the table would all come apart and go back together. Like as the meal was being served, the table would come apart and go back together. So all the, it was this modular table. Whoa. And so, and that's actually, that was the foundation for this line of furniture that I made and showed at the furniture fair called living systems. So I showed up at the furniture fair with this complete system of modular furniture that I, that w- which was sort of ridiculous because it's impossible to sell systems and modular furniture. It's not a, <laughs> was not an easy category to tackle. Uh-huh. Everyone was sort of like, wow, you know, and also like at that point, everything like Philippe Stark, he was like just God at that point. And everything was shaped like a horn and covered with you know, texture and pattern. And it was the early nineties. And so when I showed up at the furniture fair with this like clean sort of simple, I was very inspired by the Eames. I did this whole line of furniture called living systems. It was all this modular system. Mm -hmm. Everyone was like, Oh wow, that's cool. And so I showed there Barney's asked me if they could use it in the window for display. It went all went into the windows for display. That's where Murray saw it. Murray Moss saw it, saw it there. And he, called me because of that, you know, just like what, that's my first press came out of that show. I, another guy saw it. He was actually really the, the crucial. I mean, Murray was amazing. That was an amazing experience unto its own, but this guy saw it and he was building Sony Plaza. He was doing the interiors of Sony Plaza. They had designed some system that was too expensive or too complicated to make, or they didn't have time or whatever. So he came to me and said, do you want to do all the fixturing for this store in Sony Plaza, like one of the stores, you know, there were many. And I was like, yeah, sure. I didn't know what I was getting myself into, but it was, you know, like, it was like a hundred thousand dollars sale, you know, like for me, it was like in business for the year. And then he went on to Chicago and he built the North face store. They bought a whole bunch of it. I got very lucky, like right out of the gate and managed to keep my student, like I managed to like pay for everything, but it was so scary because I was making all of this furniture. I didn't really know what I was doing. And then like, I had no place to store it. Right. But have to go from the people who made it. And then I'd like get it on the truck and then it would go like, there was no, there was no room for error. Like it would have to end up there at the right time when they needed it. It was all very frightening (laughs) and big. And like, you know, the other thing is, is like, if you screw up on the hundred thousand dollar order, you're screwed. And so I did that for a year. And then I was like, 
I can't do that because I really had envisioned that I would become this little furniture company. And, and then I, when I realized what went into being a furniture company, I was like, I can't do this anymore. You know, well then Moss came along, like then some projects came out of that. So then I didn't have to just be doing the furniture. So I sort of, I got out of that being the little furniture company thing because it was very scary. Furniture is a very tough industry. There's so, so many moving parts, so much overhead and so many things that can go wrong. But wait, yeah. so your furniture was in the window at Barney's and that's where Murray Moss died. And so is that how that interior design of the Moss store happened? It did. Well, it led to the, we did one project together before Moss. Yeah, he saw it. I mean, Murray was such a visionary. I have to say all of the best projects in my life came about through people who were able to look at something that you designed and ask you to design something else, you know? So like Murray saw the furniture, he's like, Oh, this, I like this, you know? And then, so he asked me to design this exhibition, um, up, there was a fashion store up on Madison Avenue. There were, there were a few of them called Charavari and he was good friends. He, Murray came from the fashion industry and his initial instinct was why? And so then he got out of the fashion industry and then he, was very, he was a huge collector of design in all of its forms, went to Europe, sort of realized that there was all this product design in Europe that was not here in the States and sort of wondered why came back. And then he thought, well, they do it in fashion. Maybe I can sell product design in a fashion context. So he envisioned this bar. I wasn't invo- involved in it. It's called Bar Ajeti. And it was on the second floor of Charavari up on Madison Avenue. And it was, you know, it was a coffee bar design mm-hmm. store that was in this fashion store. It was like a space that Charavari had to do something with. And Murray said, yeah, I'll do this. And then when they opened that, they opened it with an exhibition of Angelo Mangerati glassware that Murray had gone and he had, you know, curated it all out of Cole as the glass manufacturer. And he had put together this show of all the samples and, and pieces of this, you know, this architect designed glassware. And so I designed this exhibition for him. So that was the first project. And then he went down to Soho and found a space down on Green Street. And then because we had done that first thing together, he asked me to do the first Moss store. And it was great. That was a great experience. Working with him was amazing. It was really fun. The reality series for Areaware might be one of your more well-known product lines. How did that happen, first of all? And then is it still ongoing? Do you have more products coming out? Just for our listeners, the reality series, you're probably familiar with it. There's a bank in the form of a pig, which looks like an actual piglet. And there's a bowl that is cast from an actual bunch of bananas. So everything is very realistic, hence the name reality series. You know, it's so funny because that is sort of this weird little bubble in my career that's been hugely successful and I've been become very associated with it. But like, if you look back at what I was doing before that, it's all very sort of simple and contemporary. And now I'm sort of back to doing the work that I was doing before that. I'm still fascinated with the reality stuff and it does go on. But I was speaking with Constantine Boyum and we were talking about Droog. Do you remember the whole mm-hmm. Droog? Mm-hmm. Yes. And, uh, and he was like, you know, a lot of people have done that high, low design before, but what Drew did really well was pull it all together and give it a formal title and, you know, make force everyone to look at it in a different way. And I, so I had that in my head. And then I met this guy out in Long Island City who's since closed, unfortunately, but he was like a museum caster. He did casting resin casting in silicone molds, which realizes this very lifelike, you know, you can really literally lift the form off of something and use it. Um, you know, that when I say museum casting, they'll like literally take a statue in a museum and then they'll replicate it and sell it in the museum store, you know, in, in resin, in a different material. And so I, well, you know, what actually prompted it was my, my grandmother had died or actually my aunt died at this point, And I inherited some silver candlesticks from her and I really loved them. they like, they were on my table and I, like I had, I've always sort of not anymore, but in my early years, I sort of grappled with 
that utopian 20th century vision of what the world was supposed to be like, like that it was supposed to be really consistent and everything in your life was supposed to be designed and it was supposed to all be built in. And, you know, it was that like Brasilia sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I had that in my head. So I was constantly trying to live this contemporary life, contemporary life. And then I got these candlesticks and I loved them, but they were these columns, these ornate columns. And I was thinking, but I really love these things. And, and like, but how could I like make them mine? So I got this idea to cast them. And, and then right at the same time, I also had the idea for the piggy bank. And I also thought it would be interesting to cast my hands. And what, like, like Constantine was saying to me, it wasn't a new idea. A lot of people had done it, but they had done it in dribs and drabs. And I thought, well, if I did all this stuff together and I showed it all together, it would be an interesting story. And then I had to grapple with the fact that it was very different than my other work. But ultimately it's a very simple story. I was just stealing form off of other things and as my early work was very literal and structural and materials driven, you know, honest in that way, this was honest in another way, you know, where it's just like, Hey, that's beautiful. I'm just going to steal that form. And then it also coincided with sampling and music and literally the, like, what was the first one? The one where they all lived in the house, the reality television program. Oh, on MTV, that one, the real world. The real world, that was just starting then. This was 2003 when I first had this idea. And and it like all coalesced into this thing that I called reality. And, you know, I pitched the idea to everyone. I brought it to Murray. I went, I, I brought it to Alberto Alessi. I brought it to Mr. Parazza, who owns Magis. Like I knew all these people through Moss. And I was like, Here, I have this idea. It's a really cool idea. I'm just going to cast all this stuff and we're going to make this stuff. And everyone like looked at me like I was crazy. Like I was showing them a picture of a pig with like change, you know, like it was just like, and, and no one got it. And I was like, you know what? This is too good an idea. And I had watched so many, you know, it's like you walk into the design show and there's the idea that you had yeah. six years ago and you're like, ah, you just want to shoot someone. Yeah. And I was like, that's going to happen with this piggy bank if I don't do this. And the piggy bank soon overcame all the other things, but the candlesticks were the beginning of it. So it all just sort of came together as this thing. And I, I actually made it for a couple of years. I had this guy who made it out in Long Island City and I had learned my lesson with the furniture because that was so complicated. And these things were like, you know, they came in normal size boxes. I could put them in my basement. I could have stock of them, you know, it was Uh not the furniture world that I had been in. So I had sort of learned my lesson there. And so I made them for a couple of years. I called in a bunch of chips. I had a guy that I knew in Japan. He became the distributor there. There were some people I knew in Italy. They became the distributor there. And I was doing all this myself and sort of selling it and you know, and it was expensive because I was making it here. You know, the pig, I think, was three or a four hundred dollar item. Mm-hmm. But I was selling them. I sold like, you know, like maybe my first year I sold like seventeen thousand dollars worth of it, which is nothing. But it's like, you know, it, it was it's also not nothing. It's something. <laughs> it was something. So, do you know, my friend Ross Menuez, he's the one who does salver for area wear. He had started that. It's a line of products. It's all animal motif and he prints them and he makes pillows out of them. They were hugely successful when he started that. And he was doing that and I was doing the pig and we were like, let's show together at the ICFF. So we took a booth and like, I'm selling my pigs. He's selling his animal pillows. And actually he had already been forming a partnership with Noel Wiggins, who started area wear and Noel was around during that show. And so what I was doing Well, he actually had a company that made resin collectible objects called Harmony Ball Corporation, which is the mother company of Areaware. And basically what happened to the whole collectible industry is when eBay came along, all of those little tchotchkes that people were buying with the idea that they might increase in value, Mm -hmm. eBay came along and everyone put them up for sale and they were worthless. So the whole collectible industry sort of devolved and he was looking for his next thing. And here I have this whole line of resin goods that are really interesting and sort of large scale and sort of can command some money. And so we just put it right into his pipeline. You know, he already had all these manufacturers that were making these things and it was a very seamless transition. And then, so really Ross, myself, 
David Weeks and Jonas Damon, we were the original designers. You know, I was there when they were naming it AreaWare. To answer your question, that seems like you asked it so long ago. (laughs) I am doing new products. Like my line for them has gone unattended for a long time. And it's had a lot of success just on its own. So it didn't need a lot of babying. And then last fall, we had a big conversation about what can we do to give, to breathe new life into reality. We did a lot of brainstorming about it. I went to China in December. I cast a bunch of new pieces and conceived of more. And so the beginning of that will show up at the gift show, some of the new products will show up at the gift show in August. And then we had gone whole into Chrome for a long time. We have some new colorways and we're really re-engineering the whole line. And that full on relaunch will happen next spring. Oh, that's exciting. So I want to ask you about Johnson and Johnson approached you to redesign the first aid kit. You know, for most people, the first aid kit is just a generic plastic box filled with Band-Aids and ointments. But you got to really turn it into a a beautiful and utilitarian and iconic object. What was that like? That I did with my very good friend, Chris Hacker, who, like Murray, he was one of my... I have three big art directors in my life. Murray, Chris Hacker, and uh, James Gager, who was my creative director at prescriptives at my first job. And I still work with him from time to time at Mac cosmetics, but Chris and I, we had done a lot of work together at various companies that he had been at. And then he's an amazing editor, creative director, design manager. And he went to Johnson and Johnson to consolidate all of their global design, which is just absolutely huge. It's just such a huge company, but he brought it all together in a space in New York city. And Literally, the first project that came across his desk was the first aid kit. And he called me so joyous. <laughs> like he was like, <laughs> and, all, and what happened was eventually he ended up with so much staff and he was keeping everyone busy. That was the only pro- I mean, I did other projects with him, but that's the only one that really came to fruition because it's, it's a complex place to navigate to be perfectly honest. I just had this vision in my mind of that blue and white and red first aid kit that had always been in my, you know, when you were, I saw one the other day, actually, in someone's like vacation home, like they had been refilling it and refilling it, refilling it, but it was like thick plastic white first aid kit. Like it was the first aid kit, you know, Mm -hmm. when you need it. And I don't know if you guys remember that, but it was, um, it was sort of an icon in my 60s childhood. And so I was excited about redoing it. And it really, the first aid kit had and um, has gone back to be, unfortunately, a, you know, completely cost engineered clamshell. Sure. Yeah. That's what it had become. And we had this opportunity to do something great. And Chris wanted some sort of, you know, I think he wanted a piece that he could point to everyone and say, hey, listen, this is what it can be. And, uh, and it, you know, he and I have a great process. We both appreciate the same things. And it's not a struggle. It's like I bring him a lot of good work. He always picks the best thing. And, and, I'm, and I feel very comfortable showing him a lot of work, you know, whereas some clients you sort of don't want to show them an out there idea because they might pick it and, you know, it could become a disaster. Like you might want to keep things safer, but with him, you know, like I can really show him the full gamut and he gets it. And he's, it's a very safe work situation with him. And so I did three iterations of it. And that, that one with that curvy form and the integral handle, just one. And, and it was very geared towards manufacturing. It was easily manufacturable and stuff. So it was pretty, pretty smooth ride you know, in terms of the design process. That sounds like a cool project. I also know that your work is in permanent collections of several museums. Which was the first piece to be acquired by which museum? And how did that make you feel? The first was actually sort of the most amazing. First time is really good. (laughs) (laughs) The first time is always the best, right? (laughs) The second year I showed at the furniture fair, I showed some lighting. You know, I, the, the first year I showed was all the systems. And then I was also really fascinated by sort of new and weird materials, always have been, still am. And 
I had found this ceramic foam material that I made some lighting out of. And Paola Antonelli was walking the fair and she saw the lighting and she was putting together a show uh, that was up, I think, 94, 95 or something like that called Mutant Materials and Contemporary Design, which was was really her big first show at the museum. And these fit into that perfectly. So she included them in the show, which was amazing. And then uh, after that, you know, they go through the show and they usually will acquire a few pieces. So they uh, decided to acquire those lamps. So I have three of them and they have four of them and I only ever made seven of them. So that's it. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Yeah, that's really exciting. Yeah, it was great. It was a, it feels a little bit like you've arrived, but then you like have to get back to work and, you know, make some money and right you've arrived but it's not going to pay your bills right (laughs) and actually now like the brooklyn museum like whereas the moma only has that one piece like the brooklyn museum has collected over the years so they have quite a big collection of my early work and later work and so they are actually going to be the ones that have the most of it at the end of the day is the brooklyn museum and that's great it's it's nice too because you sort of feel like it's safe if it gets into a museum in a way like all the other stuff could just disappear into the ether, you know? Mm -hmm. And, but the stuff that's in the museum is like, you feel like it's like maybe a little bit of history or something. It feels good. Yeah. You've designed a lot of great stuff and you've been asked to design a lot of awesome stuff. I mean, the first aid kit, Moss, um, has there ever been anything that you've been asked to design that you thought would be a great experience, but turn out to be like really sucky. I mean, in general, If someone asks me to do something, I usually say yes. I've never really been in the position where, oh, no, I couldn't possibly design. You know, like I just it's, you know, usually I need the money. And if it's something new, I'm game. You know, I usually try to make something work, but nothing really works if it's not meant to work. You know, if it's not a good relationship personally, or if it's not something you're well suited to do. So they usually sort of weed themselves out. Right. The other thing is, is that you learn all these things as you go along. So like at this point, that probably wouldn't happen. There would probably be a big red red flag and I would get out of it, you know, or. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you probably never take on a project assuming it's going to go bad, but like sometimes the client is just very difficult to work with, or they keep adding something on or the project turns into what it wasn't in the first place. Yeah. But you know what you do is every time something like that happens, you figure out the legal words, stick it in your contract. So it won't happen again. Yeah. That's really good advice. (laughs) Yeah. You go like, oh my God, yeah, that's right. They just, there was all that creep. They just kept asking me for more things, more things, more things. How do I get around that? And then you write that clause and you stick it in your contract and then you won't ever have to deal with it again, or they'll have to pay you or it'll be, you can, you know, you can end the contract or whatever. Um, But nothing ever gets antagonistic like that. I sort of feel like there's always a way to make it like good. Like it might not be as good as it could have been if you had the amazing client, but you can always make it good and passable or I, I don't know. Like I, I'm just a very positive person. So Yeah, that's a really good outlook. Just try to make the best of the situation. Yeah, I mean, that's all of life, right? You know, like, and I don't know, like, I'm maybe not the, like, the high and mighty designer that I should be. Like, sometimes I'm maybe not as demanding as I should be. But also, I find that there are a lot of different ways you can go, you know. So I like that process, too, of, like, discovering, like, sometimes it leads to interesting stuff. Also, being open and being not having this like really, really rigid style or whatever, like it can only be this way. So I don't know. I'm just, I'm a very flexible, amenable person. Like I would never let something go completely off track and be ugly or not work. The story I was going to tell you was after I did that ceramic foam, I was hired by a company to do a candle holder with it. And the guy who owned the company was fascinated by the fact that you could put this ceramic right over the flame, which seemed like sort of a bad idea to me. But 
it was like my first, you know, like product, it, not my first, but it was like right at the beginning. So you want these things to happen. Mm-hmm. And I listened to him, I listened to him and listened to him. And, you know, I kept showing him these donuts, you know, where the light would go through it, but the heat would go up through the middle. And I'd made all these beautiful donuts and out of this ceramic foam, which was really the right way to go. And I kept saying, but no, he wanted it right over the flame. He wanted it right over the flame. And so like, okay, so I did it. And then the product came out and what turned out happening was it wasn't a problem with the ceramic foam itself, because what he was fascinated by was the fact that this stuff is made out of these ceramics that have these really intense properties, like they can withstand really, really high heat. So you could put this thing right over the flame. And that to him was an opportunity But I just thought it was beautiful, like when the light came through it. So that I wasn't as fascinated with, but whatever, he was fascinated with it. So I designed this thing and it actually wasn't a problem with the ceramic foam. But what happened was the candles would, it would get so hot in there that they lit each other so that it would go from being the wick being lit to the whole can, the whole tea light being lit, you know, so like the whole disc would light up. So these things were like explode, you know, like they would oh just my, wow. come out on the inside. And I sort of was like, I told you that, like I was, I know I was right. Like I can go back to like, I can track it down to like a million emails where I go, I really think we should do this donut, you know, like, so anyway, but it was a disaster and it was, be, and it was because exactly that, like I was looking for the opportunity in the framework that he was giving me and I wasn't secure enough in myself to say, no, this is a red flag. I will not do that, you know, and I allowed myself to go in a wrong direction. Was that a good story? That was a great story. And I bet you never let it happen again. No, I mean, the minute you have a red flag, I'll be, I'll like sit there or I'll, I'll, I'll be like in my studio and I'll go there's something bothering me. What is it? Something's bothering me. Like, what is it? And it might be like a note in a contract or it might be something in a project that like, I won't even know what it is, but I'll know that something's wrong. Like, what is this (laughs) thing? I have to identify it. I have to find it and I have to address it. What is it? And that happens all the time. And in the design thing, yeah, like I would never, I would never not say it. Yeah, I mean, the thing that I designed for him, it was interesting and it was nice looking. You know, you can always make it beautiful, but it had this structural problem with it that was really dangerous, actually. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, very dangerous. Exploding (laughs) candles. Yeah, that's kind of scary. Okay, so as far as your creative process goes, if a client comes to you with a brief, do you have a place you usually start? I'm sure the briefs are all really different, but is there any consistency in your process? No, I mean, every project is different from every aspect. When I first started, I can remember I like had a lawyer write up a contract for me so I could use that contract. I have never used the same contract twice. You know, they all need to be adjusted. And the same thing goes for the process. You know, like everyone that comes to you is different. The client brings you different things. You know, you bring different things to it. And for instance, I just did a project with Ecovative, the material company. They grow a material out of mushrooms. Really amazing. Cool. When I was working with them, I had to start with the material, right? Like I had to learn about the material, you know, in other cases, you'll, you're working for a brand, you know, and you need to merge your work or it needs to be appropriate for that. You, it needs to be Harry Allen for Mm so-and-so, you know, and so you need to learn a lot about that brand. There are other cases where, you know, it's not even Harry Allen. It's just, I'm doing, you know, like if I'm doing that, like when I did that bottle from Mark Jacobs, the bang bottle from Mark Jacobs, you know, it was just all about doing something for Mark Jacobs. There's that spectrum too. It's like, what's your relationship with the client? Are they asking you for Harry Allen? I am very sensitive to brand work. Early on, I did all that cosmetics work. And that's an environment where there's a great consistency to branding and to brand identity. So I I became very sensitive to that. It's also an environment where you sit around a boardroom and there's 12 people that need to be satisfied. So like some projects are me in my studio going, oh, I think I'm going to cast a pig today. And then some projects are like, you're in the boardroom and like everyone's going to weigh in on this thing and you need to make everyone happy. And, and I like both of those things equally. I, and I'm probably an oddball in that I do. I find doing my own work is very hard, like waking up and thinking about what it is that 
I'm going to make, like, if it's a piece of art, that's really hard. Like what's worth making, you mm-hmm. know, in what, what am I interested in today? What am I going to do today? Right. When you have no parameters, then you just, you have to make every single decision and choice and it's so wide open. Sometimes it's overwhelming. That's actually probably the harder way, but then it's all fun to me and challenging in different ways and uses different sides of my brain. You know, like I, like the one is very social, the one is very solitary, but then in terms of like the process, you know, I'm the kind of person who, if left to my own devices, I have, you know, a wonderful partner in my life that he's more systematic and He has a routine. He's more routine oriented. But if I was left up to my own devices, I wouldn't eat the same thing for breakfast. I would wake up at different times. I would go to bed at different times. I like my life to be different. I like to present myself with different things. And that's the same way the design process is for me. So I probably, even if I was given the same project twice, would approach it two different ways. And so this is, I'm sort of not answering your question. You're answering it by not answering it. (laughs) Yeah, because I can't can't really, you know, like I am, I'm really interested in materials. Material is always going to be part of the story. The story is always going to be part of the story. I'm really interested in some sort of narrative thread that goes through things. Like if you can get three things to triangulate, like it's the, (laughs) it's hard to explain, but like the piggy bank is a great example. You know, it's got, it's got so many references references in it, you know, and all together, you, you, it sort of zings like almost like a a piece of a good piece of art in a way, you know, like it resonates Mm -hmm. because of the story, you know, it's like, it's the real pig that was cast that looks like the piggy bank that never really actually looked like a pig that, you know, and is it a piece of art? Is it, you know, there's like just so many points of reference and everyone goes like, oh yeah, pig that's cool. Like, I love that pig. You know, I love pigs. You know, people give it to their grandkids. I'm like, it's a dead pig that I cast, but okay. (laughs) But you know, like that's, you strive for that. You strive for that zing in everything you do. You have all of these tools in your toolkit as a designer, you know, color, form, concept is a big one for me. So it's got to, it's got to have a good story. It's got to have some sort of reason to be function, ergonomics, you know, there there are all these things that you can draw from. Not everything can be in there either. So then you have to sort of strike the, you know, like I'm interested in all these things, but it can only have three things in it. So what's that balance? What's, what balance do you strike? But then you have the client too, that's sort of helping you sort through those things. You know, Mm -hmm. there's a first phase where it'll just be like research and dialogue with the client. The second phase, I'll uh, put together a presentation and I'll, and I'll, present, you know, it'd be the, the design phase where I'm actually presenting like maybe two, three, four, I usually present like if I have whatever good ideas, whatever viable ideas I think I have, I usually show them. Then they'll, will together, we'll select something or a variety of things or a body of, you know, things. And then, and then there's the refinement you know, and I'm, and I'm all right. If someone says, Oh, Hey, I think it should be a little shorter, a little bit taller. Like they're, they're the client. Like they, they have all this experience in their product category. I'll also tell them if I think they're wrong, but it's, you know, in general, I'll listen to my client and then you refine it. And then that might go a couple of rounds and then you take that refined object and then you do a drawing set And then when it gets to manufacturing, there's usually a bunch of things that you need to get around or over or adjust according to the manufacturing. You know, I have a lot of manufacturing knowledge in my head, so I often will anticipate a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, a couple of directions you could take, but you, you know, you also want to listen to the guy who's going to be making it too. You want to push them around just enough to make it interesting, but you don't want to, you want to listen to them because they know what they're doing. They've made a lot of things in their product category. And then, you know, I usually stay involved with it till the very end when, you know, initial samples come out and you sort of, you approve them and then it goes into production. That's like the literal thing on paper, how it goes down. But those things happen all out of order and they, you know, like it's never, it's never a straight line, yeah. but that's the, that's the basic of it. I know that um, you've mentioned a bunch of times that materials really excite you and they excite me too. And I love the challenge of working with a new material, mostly because it feels like a world of wide open possibilities. And I am really excited, especially to use materials in atypical ways. And I think you are too. And I just want to know what is that goosebump feeling 
for you when you get to work with a new material? You know, you're talking, you're talking about the, the process, right. And that literal boring process that I just outlined, (laughs) you know, like what makes that process interesting is when you add something new to it. And a really easy thing to add that's new to it is a new material. And it's actually really hard to work with new materials, but it does add this level of excitement and makes things unfamiliar and gets you into unfamiliar territory. And unfamiliar territory, honestly, is where great things happen. And that's where you like to spend most of your time. I mean, you already said you don't like routine. It sounds to me like you're kind of an explorer always. I'm very comfortable with unknowns. And, you know, it's, yeah, I am. <laughs> no, <laughs> I could go on and on. But the, the thing is, the material thing happened to me early on, and it's just sort of part of me now. Like, I don't think about it or labor over it as much. And I also have realized that, like, for instance, that ceramic foam story that I told you before about the exploding candles, mm-hmm. that, that's... That's what happens often when you work with something that's completely new, you know, like it, we did, we had no idea whether that was going to happen. No one had done that before with that material, you know, and all the things that it said it could do. Plus working with the manufacturers is often, is often difficult. So it's, it's often difficult to work with like these new and unusual materials. But then when I'm presented with the Ecovative project that I just did for the design pavilion, like it was so much fun because actually I had, I was working for the material company. And so I had them to guide me along. So it made that process of exploration and working with a really completely new material, much more comfortable and much easier and less unknown. So that was actually a really great situation working with them. So you've been in the industry for a while. You've done a lot of different things from interiors to products. Is there anything in the industry that you find tiresome or in need of improvement? Oh my God, it's so many things. I mean, (laughs) it's like the you know, when you really notice it is like when you try to go out and buy like a fan for your room or whatever, you know, and, and it's like, I'm a designer. Like I want a good looking fan. Try to find a good looking fan. Right, it's it's hard. really, really hard. Yeah. It's really hard. And like, I can't believe it. Like, I can't believe that it's that hard. You know, there is some great stuff out there, you know, but for the amount of product that's sold in the world, there's so much ugly stuff and bad stuff and stuff that's bad for the environment and stuff that's poorly made and stuff that will break and crap that just fills these box stores that people buy and they just fill up their shopping carts, like just with piles of crap that's going to break and end up in the landfill. And it just drives me crazy. Can you hear it? Yes, (laughs) I can. (laughs) Preach the gospel. I think a lot of designers feel the same way you do, because I've had this conversation with a bunch of different people in the design world that also feel like there's just so much stuff, you know, like, do people really need another chair? Do people really need another, you know, X, Y, Z? It can be really depressing. Yeah, yeah. Well, we will always need another chair. Let me just stand up for the chair here. (laughs) There are areas that just haven't really been considered enough, like fans, And so that's the stuff that, I mean, somebody finally tackled the thermostat. That was pretty cool. Right. Ceiling fans have enjoyed a renaissance lately. Thank God. Yes. I just, I was just specking some ceiling fans and I found some nice ones. I was like, oh yeah, that's good. I mean, it, and it, it happens in, I think, you know, in increments and it's just for the amount of design talent in the world and the amount of bad product that's made, there's something wrong with the formula. You know, we're fighting the good fight. I always say, I think people should live with less, better things. I agree with that. Just edit. Yeah, edit. just edit it out and really consider what you buy. And just because it's cheap, you don't buy a lot or more. Or, I don't know. It just that whole box store thing, I think, is such a, a trap, you know, such a, a it's such a trap. But it's it's where we're at right now. So it's the. You know, it's the way of the world, the way of the United States. And I'm sucked into it, too. You know, you like get into Costco and it's like, oh, my God, I can have, you know, like a whole bushel of you end up you come back home. And a you bushel. Like, 
<laughs> yes. like a bushel of everything. It's like, I can't possibly eat this or, you know, like, what am I going to do with, you know, like all of these towels or whatever, you know, you're just like, oh my God. You did a day in the life article for Design Milk a few years ago. And it was really cool because we had never done one like what you did because you were in China that day and you documented a whole day where you cast your hand in a mold. I think it was the iPhone hand that held the, the smaller iPhone. So you mentioned in the article that you were originally working with a factory located in the U.S. and then they closed and you moved your production to China. Can you talk a little bit about what that was like and then what you like and don't like about overseas manufacturing? This is another one of my rants, but I will spare <laughs> you. Um, I mean, I'm I'm very sad about the loss of manufacturing in the United States because the factory is the industrial designer's playground. Mm -hmm. It's where great things happen if you're an industrial designer. So the fact that many factories have been moved around the other side of the world bums me out, you know, but that's reality. And there's still a lot of people left making things here. It's, I was out yesterday visiting a brush factory out in Long Island, which is amazing. They still make brushes. You know, it's the whole box store mentality also, because all of this stuff comes from China in containers, really cheap and ends up in box stores and no one knows who made it or where it comes from. And there's no there's no face with the product. You don't know anyone that makes anything anymore. It's like the entire manufacturing sector has been lifted out of our society. And actually, that's what adds value to what I do. If, if the person who lives next door makes scissors, then you know someone who makes scissors. So you're going to buy their scissors. You understand that they go to work every day, that they need to pay themselves insurance that they, you know, in order to make those scissors, you understand what goes into it. They're human beings behind those scissors. But if those scissors just arrive in the store and they're, you know, 29 cents, you'll just buy them because they're 29 cents. But no one understands what goes into the manufacturing. So in any event, that's that's my big problem with the whole foreign manufacturing story, the fact that it's sort of manufacturing has been removed and manufacturing is a great complement to my profession. So that sort of bums me out. But then you get to China and you realize there are all these real people, passionate people who are making things over there too. When going there, like Lee, actually, the Lee Chang, the guy who owned the factory that made all of my reality products, I have a I had a really nice relationship with him. Unfortunately, he just died um, about a month ago, mm. which very unexpectedly, it's got me really sad. But um, because I developed a great relationship with him, he's a passionate man. He's a, he loved making my stuff. He was a resin manufacturer and, and resin had really gotten a bad rap. You know, it, it had ended up in a lot of bad product categories. People thought of it as a cheap material. And then all of a sudden I came along with this very high art, line of products, you know, he, he thought I was wonderful because I really gave him a business back and he wined and dined me and we had great conversations. He was a musician and he had a really wonderful new family over there and he had lived many years in the United States. So he understood where I was coming from. We, we had a great relationship. So there's, there's a reality to manufacturing in China that is very real and human and all that. So that, uh, that's the plus side of it. But there's also like when you go there, you realize that in exporting all of our manufacturing there, we've also exported all of the problems that go along with manufacturing. Their waterways are so polluted. The air mm. is so polluted. There are people working in the factory and you honestly go like, you know, like, do I turn a blind eye to this child that's making this thing? Uh -huh. We ran a really good shop, but I went, I, I visited many factories, you know, and you see these people like in these rooms, like finishing metal, like they're in this dark space finishing. Like, it's just like, you can't even, you know, you just go, okay. I mean, they're, they're, it's, they probably have a better life than they did in the fields. Now they're working here, you know, and then China's there, you know, but it, it, and then you just have to move to the next country because everyone in China is going to want to have health insurance at some point also. So it's just you keep like exporting it, exporting it, exporting it. And then it's then all of a sudden we're going to be the cheapest country to manufacture. <laughs> They're going to ship all the tools back here again. You know, so it's like 
it's, it's not great the way it is, but it is the way it is. So you just sort of deal with it. Mm -hmm. Um, I work with people that own some companies, one in particular that like, they've never been there. And I'm like, how can you not have been there? Like, how can you, why you can't, you have to go look at what's going on. You need to be aware of what's going on in these places, in these factories, you know? So it's sort of like, there's like a sort of like, you wash your hands of it. It's like, okay, we've shipped it off. You know, they're, they're making it, they're polluting their, you know, but the brands who, who, you know, export their manufacturing need to be aware of how their stuff's being made. It's amazing to me that they wouldn't have. And share the responsibility, I think, of the the problems that it creates, like the pollution and the healthcare and the insurance and all of that. Absolutely. But no one's making them do it over there. Right. And then you'll hear like, oh, we're taking our manufacturing to, you know, Thailand now or whatever, you know, like it's like because it's cheaper and that's all driven by these huge boxy, you know, like cheap goods, you know, it's all driven by that stuff. Mm -hmm. So the idea of less Better would really benefit everyone across the board, you know. Hallelujah. I agree with you. Answer the China thing. I'm not sure whether I answered it, but I'm conflicted about it. But I've also had some amazing experiences over there. So that was a full spectrum answer. I appreciate that you sort of painted the picture from all the different angles for us. But now I want to take your mind off of that conflict, the intention that you feel and put it squarely on something super fun. I hear that you're an amazing roller skater. Yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this like disco party roller skating? Is this like glitter hot pants and tube socks? Well, I mean, I'm not really a hot pants and tube socks kind of guy, but it is. Yes, it's dance skating. I am, a, you know, I skate on quads. And it's funny because I really don't skate that much anymore. But there was a period where every Tuesday night you could find me at the Roxy skating for like, you know, 10, 15 years of my life when I was younger. Oh, that's so fun. In Central Park and the skate circle and up and down the West Side Highway and, you know, just everywhere. And it's so funny because John, my partner, he's actually a very avid rollerblader or was an avid rollerblader back in the day. And, but we are, you know, we're sort of like, we have a house in the country, you know, we're out there on the weekends now. And that's when you would be up in Central Park, sweating it out with everyone in the dance circle. You know, and a lot of the roller rinks have closed, like the Roxy is gone. I think Skate Key was up in the Bronx, but they've closed. Now, if I want to go roller skating, I got to go out to Staten Island. I haven't made it yet, but I, John has promised me, promised me for my birthday (laughs) that we would go out there one Friday or Saturday night and see what it's like out at Roller Jam in Staten an island so <laughs> that could possibly happen at some point this summer yeah it's so much fun it's like no other feeling in the world and I'm pretty good you know like I think you, you have to get to a point with it where you're not like falling on your ass and and I'm a pretty fluid skater so the combination of the skating and the music and I'm a big spinner I can spin <laughs> and it's fun it feels great oh. Skates are miraculous little engineering feats, the actual skates, because the the leverage you get off the wheels and the fact that the trucks turn so you can you can cut a really tight circle on a quad, you know, on the four wheel skate. I find them much better than rollerblades. I did rollerblade for many years, too, but I um, I've always been partial to skates. And then when you get on like a slick floor, like a really good roller rink floor, there's no other feeling like it in the world. I want to walk around saying I'm going to cut a tight circle on these quads. Like I like <laughs> I like that I heard the skate jargon. <laughs> yeah, I'm just sitting there spinning. I'm a good spinner. Spinning is amazing. When you get on center and you're spinning around, it's really a great feeling. Is there anything you haven't done yet that you need to do before you die? In terms of work, oh, I'd love to design a car. (laughs) I'd love to design a teapot. You know, like I'd love to click off all of the really sort of big, you mentioned thermostat. I'd love to design a thermostat, you know, but there's probably nothing on my desk or in my house I I was having some conversations with a potential client and they have, it's like a big company and they have all these different brands down below. And he's like, well, I think you'd be best with this brand and this brand, but if there's anything else you see here that you'd like to design, you know, let us know. And I'm like looking at the list. And so I wrote him back and I said, basically 
I can design everything on that list. I would love to. It won't happen that way, but it's more interesting to do something that I haven't done before. I, yeah. I don't think I'll ever stop. Everyone's like, oh, when I retire or whatever. And then, you know, like I looked at Ava Zeisel. I don't know how old she was when she died and she was working till the day she died. And I think, mm-hmm. oh, that's, I want to have like my pencil in my hand and my exacto knife in my other hand. And I want to pass out on the floor. <laughs> So we'll see, but that's the goal anyway. (laughs) Well, what about a current or new project that you have that you really want our listeners to know about? I alluded to it a couple of times, but I didn't describe it in detail, but I just did an amazing project with Ecovative, which is this material company that makes material out of mushrooms. They grow a material out of mushrooms. And I designed a pavilion for them that was made a lot out of their material. And then they pursued a project that had been that they had been incubating for a while. They developed a line of acoustic tiles. So it's a product category and their material, this ecovative mushroom material lends itself to that very much. So we all developed product for them, but I did a line of acoustic tiles that when they're assembled, they look like a giant woven fabric structure. And um, so the core is the ecovative material. And then I decided because it alluded to fabric, I wanted them to be fabric covered also. And also the fabric covering helps absorb some sound also. And uh, in order to do that, I called a friend of mine, a woman who runs Design Text, um, Susan Lyons. And she hooked me up with this amazing material that she developed a couple of years ago because the ecovative material is completely compostable and I was going to put fabric on top of it. And I thought, well, I should have a good environmental story from the fabric also. So she hooked me up with this compostable fabric that she developed a few years ago. And then we glued it all together with a soy based glue that I sourced from E2E, which is a company that like a materials company Mm -hmm. and uh, a very interesting materials company. And it's a material that's used to glue plywood together. So it's a very strong glue heat pressed. So I've created this acoustic tile for them that's completely compostable. Wow. I'm excited to see it. Yeah, it's very exciting. Tell our listeners where they can find out more information about you, like your website and your social media handles. Actually, if you go to my website, harryallendesign.com, you can connect to all of my social media from there. Well, thank you for sharing all that juiciness inside that skull of yours with us. Like you poured it all out for us. That was so great. Oh, I appreciate your even having me on. So um, and it was nice speaking with you and the questions were great. Thank you so much. How about that Harry Allen? Oh, yeah. One day I'm going to cast a pig and then I'm going to go out roller skating. And then I'm going to garden <laughs> right? garden in the suburbs with my partner. And you know what I thought was really fascinating about him, though, is the ease with which he can traverse all the different areas of design. Not just the disciplines, but when he was talking about working with a corporate client versus working for himself... And he's really comfortable in both of those worlds. I don't think that's true for everybody. Or or at least even if they're comfortable, I don't think they enjoy it the way he does. But he seems yeah. to enjoy everything. Yeah, I mean, he's he seems like incredibly flexible. Yeah. Uh, and, and pretty laid back for a New Yorker. Yeah, definitely. His childhood sounded really cool, too. Like having all of the freedom and the wide open, you know, yards and streets to run around in of the suburbs, but then regular trips into the city with, you know, a loving family. I think that sounds like kind of a fertile territory for a designer to grow out of, especially he has an engineer father and an arts educator mom that plants the seed for all that good design that comes out of his brain. And it seems like he's kind of come full circle too because now he's going upstate on the weekends here and there and then coming back to the city to work and he talks about driving back into the city and you know what that experience is like yeah he says he doesn't get butterflies anymore though as you get older it doesn't seem like as many things give you butterflies and it's kind of a bummer (laughs) i know (laughs) i know when was the last time you got butterflies i don't even know I I would love to know if any of our listeners um, would like to share things that give them butterflies still in their 20s and 30s and 40s. Yes, that is a great question. I want to know that too. Hit us up on the website or on Twitter. Let us know what gives you butterflies. Thanks for listening, guys. Hey, did you know that you can get new episodes of Clever on Stitcher, Overcast, iHeartRadio and SoundCloud? 
And as usual, you can always find us on iTunes and Google Play. So subscribe wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss another episode. Plus, you can sign up for our newsletter, read the show notes, and see images of Harry's work at cleverpodcast.com. Connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Clever Podcast because we love hearing from you. This episode of Clever was edited by Chris Modell of Your Studio with music by L1011. 